Hey guys, and welcome to the Point and Click Adventurers podcast. My name is Michael, your Point and Click Adventurer, also known as Yak Wax Lips. Now, unfortunately, my co-host is, is nowhere to be seen. Poor old Turian Shepherd is off poorly, so you've just got me today. However, you won't have to deal with me for much longer because we have a ginormous interview with none other than Tony Warriner of Revolution Software. Um, before we dive into that, though, if it's your first time here on the Point and Click Adventurers podcast, um, we just talk about adventure games, point and click games, um, FMV games, anything that's adventurous and from old and new. So if you like that kind of thing, make sure that you subscribe and rate and all that kind of stuff, stuff that helps push this more into the algorithm so that more people enjoy adventure games. Um, right now, normally we have a big theme that we talk about, but I'm not going to do that because Torian's not here and we'll talk about um, stuff next week. So what I'm going to do is leave you in the capable hands of myself again a couple of days ago when I did an interview with Tony Warner. Now, the original interview was over an hour and a half long um, and I could have talked for even longer. However, I've trimmed it down to a very healthy hour long interview and we basically talk about his career from the start at school all the way through to when he left Revolution and what he's up to now and most importantly the book he's written all about that so get yourself comfy guys and please enjoy this interview with tony warriner my guest today co-founded one of the most recognizable adventure game studios ever revolution software helping create games like law of the temptress beneath the steel sky and of course the broken sword series having been in the industry for over 30 years he's now written a book all about it so welcome to the point and click adventurers podcast tony warriner hello Hi there, how are you doing? Yes, I'm very well. So, does it feel like 30 years? Uh, that's a good question, actually. I mean, uh, it, I mean, in some ways, yes, in some ways, no. Uh, I mean, I mean, it, it is it is a long time ago, and uh, it, you know, I, I started to realize recently that 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 it was a long time ago. Some of that stuff, and uh, you know, when people start, people like that that talk to me and they and they, and they weren't alive like in the 80s you know it's like yeah. <laughs> or even sometimes the 90s it's like uh, oh, actually a lot of time has passed doesn't it yeah it's, it's like a mythical a mythical time before the internet and before iphones and you know the sort of stuff it's hard to imagine yeah yeah well that i grew up in that era as well i was a kid of the, the 90s i was born in the early 80s so i was very much when your games come, come out i was like the ideal age so for me, this interview is like a dream interview. So thank you very much for, for coming on. Um, Welcome. We're going to delve into a lot in today's interviews, but I think the best thing to do is to start at the start and say, how did you enter the industry in the, and how did you come to create Revolution? Let's go back to like the mid 80s or so when you first dived in. Uh, well, I mean, I first saw, me, me and my friends and my, my generation, I guess, um, we've, we first saw home computers as they called them uh like literally 1980 1981 that kind of that kind of era i mean the, we, we kind of were aware of them being the thing because they started turning up in schools and things and it'd be like apples and things like that you know and, and no one really knew what they were and it was just it was just a thing and and, and you, you know it was you're aware of it but not you didn't know you didn't know what it was really um, and then the Sinclair ZX eighty one um, really changed things because uh, it, it was it was marketed very aggressively at consumers, you know, and 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 the price of it was actually pretty good, uh, you know, it wasn't expensive at all for what it, for what it was, uh, and, and people could afford them. And um, you know, a, a lot of my friends got got a ZX eighty one, and you know, it was it was just so fascinating because the the, the scope of what the machine could do was like nothing else you know it wasn't you know you, you could buy you could buy lego and you can you can build things with it but it's 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 kind of limited in scope and, and you can build things with electronics and a lot of people were into electronics and we were building little radios crystal radios and stuff like that but it was really hard to, to do anything different you know you could follow the instructions but you know you, you couldn't I mean, some people could, but we couldn't. It was it was hard stuff, you know, to to understand electronics enough to make a new thing out of electronics. I mean, that 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 took a lot of understanding, you know. But the, the, this computer, the ZX eighty one. I mean, you, you could you could learn the language, the programming language, and and then you suddenly realised that that the scope was enormous, and and you could you could actually do it. You know, you could actually learn this language and and start producing different things. You know, it was mind blowing because there's nothing else like it at all. Um, 
so we had these machines at home and then uh, you know at school we 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 we, we found um because the, I mean, the other thing was the schools didn't understand these machines they'd all been sent bbc micros and stuff and then the, the schools had no idea what to do with them so we, we found a, a bunch of bbc micros in a cupboard in a store cupboard and we used, to, we used to go there on the lunchtime and just play on the bbc micro you know it was great <laughs> <laughs> it was the only good thing about school, to be honest. The BBC Micro was hidden away, but um, and, and you know, no no internet, nothing else to do. So you could just you could just sink hours and hours and hours into into learning home computers, and you know, pretty soon you would you're if you're into it, you'd you'd be learning assembly code, and and from from assembly code, you're you're into writing games, you know, pretty quick because that's the best thing to do. You know, you you could write a serious program to to what could you do? I mean, what else could you do? It never occurred to me to write anything that wasn't a game, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So that was like the early mid eighties. Um, so after yeah. school then, was there any point when you think I want to do this for a career? Was it like straight away or, or do you have odd jobs there here and there and just kind of, did you slide into it slowly? Kind of straight away. I mean, I was just obsessed with the, with the machine. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to do anything else. You know, I was having a bad time at school. So I, I mean, I just wanted to, just wanted to to get out of that as quickly as possible, and and I, I reckoned I could make games, and and you know, uh, I I kept I kept writing little ones and getting slightly bigger and slightly bigger, and uh, you know, people would know I talk about a game called Obsidian, which is the first one I wrote when I was when I was still at school, and, and got that published by um, a company that was oddly enough quite local, quite local to here, um, called Arctic Computing, and they were they were quite big in the in the early eight bit era. They, they did very well with um, quite a lot of their games. I mean, by the time, I mean, things were moving very quickly. And by the time, sort of mid, just past the mid 80s, they were actually starting to suffer as the big American firms um, kind of moved in and started bringing bringing bigger bigger American games and porting them onto the, onto the European um, home computers, you know, like Spectrum and stuff. So that the smaller hobbyist type, publishers in the uk were starting to suffer a little bit and arctic was one of those so they were very they, I mean, they were very excited by by my game and thought it might be one that would help them uh, break into the the amstrad cpc market so i basically yeah. went straight from school to there you know yeah so you've got from the mid 80s you've got this game that you're excited about it's been picked up it's gonna be it's been released um now from there revolution started uh in the late uh, late eighties. Uh, so kind of, you've got a five year gap there really. Um, were you, um, continuously making games throughout that whole time, just trying to break into the market even more, or was there other places that you, um, applied your talents? Uh, well, what happened was I was at Arctic and obviously Charles Cecil was at Arctic. So Charles, Charles was the, the guy that published by game obsidian. Um, that, that company, Fairly, some fairly dramatic things happened there, and it all kind of broke up. Uh, me, me and Charles uh, went to work in London uh, on a, on a new company of, that he set up um, called Paragon Programming, which uh, our, our 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 purpose was to port company, uh, games, American games, for companies like US Gold. So there was a lot, a lot of games from a company called DataSoft, which had been picked up, and they were often Commodore sixty four games. And the idea was that they just put them out to people to port onto Amstrad or uh, there's the cat, uh, <laughs> Amstrad or or uh, Spectrum, basically. So we were doing that in London, uh, and we did quite well at it. We did we did numerous games quite quickly. Uh, you know, it was all it was all going quite well. Uh, and then US Gold said to Charles, "Hey, why don't you come and be our development manager? Because because you understand the process. So come and come and actually work here." So that was good for Charles. It was less good for me. <laughs> <laughs> I headed back up for back up to Hull, uh, unemployed in like 1987 or something. Um, what did I do then? Uh, then I, then I, I I I instantly got a job in Harrogate with a company called Cascade Games. Who were a bit like Arctic, and that they they'd done very well uh, with, a, with a with a thing called um, there's the doorbell. <laughs> they'd done very well with a game called with a cassette cassette fifty. It was called. They had fifty really bad games on it, and they sold <laughs> billions of these things and yeah. bought themselves Porsches and um, expanded and stuff like that. So I went to work there for a, for a year or so, 
we did a game called 19 Boot Camp, which was uh, based on the song 19, which yeah, I don't know if you're familiar with that. I'm it was not, like number no. one for it. <laughs> it was, was that it like was 1988-ish? A, I probably would have been in was, six, maybe. <laughs> right. <laughs> look it up on look it up on YouTube. It goes no 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 nineteen nineteen. It was a song about the uh, the Vietnam War. Right. <laughs> it was number one for for months or something like that. Okay. So they made it. The, the idea was to make a game of that, but someone had got the rights. Um, uh, Activision or someone had got the rights, and uh, found it out to Cascade to make a game. So we all did that. Uh, and that was okay. Then, then, uh, and the game was pretty good. It was a crash smash, stuff like that. But then that company imploded. Um, so I came back to Hull, uh, teamed up with a guy called Adam Waring, who now works at Future Publishing, uh, and um, we were just uh, freelancing games for Codemasters for a few years. Uh, we did that, and we we were okay. I wrote a game called Death Stalker. Adam wrote a game called Ninja Massacre. They were quite nice little games. Um, so we were doing that and then uh, Charles was then he'd moved on from US Gold and gone to Activision where he was development manager and and he was looking at he, he was he was seeing a lot of Sierra titles going through Activision because they were the dis- distributor um, for Sierra so they knew they knew that market extremely well you know they knew what games were selling well what, what games weren't so the adventure they had all this inside information about adventure games and Charles was into adventures as well because he'd done some at Arctic um, a few years earlier in you know, Adventure A, Adventure B, Adventure C, that kind of thing. Um, if you look at the old back catalogue, there's some really ancient um, text-based Charles adventures there. Yeah. Uh, so he put that together with you know his knowledge of the market and and figured that adventure games were maybe a good thing to to do if he was going to get back into development. Uh, which eventually he decided to do as Activision UK went started to go down. Uh, it was it was basically it was doing really well. It, it, I mean, this is a very familiar story. UK UK end of a of a of a, an American company is doing extremely well, but the American company is doing extremely bad and pulls the whole thing down. Uh, same thing happened to Activision UK at that time. So Charles was then thinking, what shall I do? And he said, adventure games. Let's go back to adventures. So he he gave me a call. And um, said, "Do you want to do you want to do it?" And uh, we all met up in Wales to discuss the plan, and a revolution was born. Pretty much, that was that would be late eighty nine. Late eighty nine, nineteen eighty nine. Um, yeah, that story is. Um, I've heard it so many different times with so many different uh, people, and it's still just <laughs> you know, it's the birth of revolution. It's fantastic. I love it. Um. So you go into a revolution, um, co-founder of of what is these days seen as one of the big hitters uh, on the scene. Um, now, your first game is Law of the Temptress. Now, did you have any uh, experience of creating adventure games? Obviously, you said Charles did with Adventure A, B and C. But I mean, how did you approach creating an adventure game in, in 89, 90? Uh, we, I mean, we didn't have any specific, um, experience because, you know, what we were looking at were, were called, um, what are they called? Graphic adventures. Yeah. Graphic adventures. Point and click was a, was a term, I guess it was. Um, I mean, we looked at, uh, some Sierra stuff like allegedly Larry we played, um, and we dragged, we dragged a PC up, up to Wales, um, and, um, from from Activision and we played Low Suit Larry and I think King's Quest one of the King's Quest and, and you know and, and I was looking at it from a technical point of view and you know could we could we beat it you know could we do it could we do something better you know like like it it was more of a thing in those days that 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 people were looking for a technical advantage with each iteration of games you know it was what can you do that takes it a bit further from a from a from an engine point of view and the machines were, were the, the machines were constantly improving so you, you know the, there was always a new space to move into technically um if that makes sense so you know charles was i mean he was thinking of game ideas but you know he was saying to me uh and, and dave sykes uh, uh, a programmer i knew that i'd brought along as well um to be part of it you know can, can we beat it can we beat that engine um and, and what what we saw when we played low suit larry was that it was very much one based on one screen you know you, you'd be on you'd be in a certain location and, and that was where the things happening would be and and the, the location you just left would effectively be frozen 
nothing you know nothing when you went back nothing would have changed um yeah. and, and and our big idea was to basically move make the characters walk between locations and walk around the, have the whole world it's kind of live um yeah. you know that that was what we said we could do um and charles charles was like oh yeah that sounds pretty pretty cool um go away and make the engine you know and also actually um we we just after we decided that we we went to um uh one of the one of the shows the big shows in london i can't remember which one it was it might have been a micro fair or it might have been might have been the pcw show which was a big a big thing back then it was kind of the the e3 of the uk in the, yeah. in, the in the early 90s it, it was quite a good show actually um and we saw we went to level nine stand because level nine we were, were big admirers of because i mean all their stuff's brilliant absolutely brilliant um adventure games and they were they they'd come to the same conclusion and they they were showing a game called um something to do with raj like uh you know sort of uh indian raj stuff yeah and, and that that was doing the same thing it was moving characters around one location to another so we kind of thought yeah this is you know we're onto something because you know level nine are doing it and we've we've in parallel had the same had the same thought so um you know that 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 was kind of, that kind of it's proof that we we were down the right line or, or we thought we were yeah yeah i remember, i remember playing law of the temptress i had it on the amiga for i had the big box version and everything um i think my dad bought it from our price at the time um yeah and for me who had i played like the lucas arts games at that point i think monkey island uh, one and two um and then when i played law of the temptress and trying to find a certain person and that person wasn't where I left them. It was a big shock, um, but it was great. It, it, was, it felt, yeah, it felt lived. It felt real. It felt like, Oh my God, this place, you know, these people have lives to go to. Um, now you obviously, you took that into your next game as well, beneath the still sky. Um, how, how was the production on that? What was the, what was the story behind that one? Uh, we did, we, we we did take the the what we call virtual theater the, uh, the the autonomous characters across but you know we even then we were starting to have you know we weren't we weren't admitting it but in the back of our minds that there was a bit of a problem with virtual theater in, in, in that it was quite difficult to design for because the the things you got the characters to do were off screen which was the fundamental flaw because so you didn't see it you know yeah uh, so you know it, it was actually it, it was a bit too clever for its own good in a way. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we could have, I mean, the other thing was we could have faked it, you know, little, little temptress. It really does do what we said. It, it, you know, the characters really do walk around and they, they do walk around across screens that, that they're off screen, you know, yeah. and we could have, every, I mean, it's funny, every, everything that little temptress does, it would have been really easy just to fake it and, and, and <laughs> pretend we'd done it. Um, I only realized that recently, actually, <laughs> I was looking at it and going, hang on, why did we do it? <laughs> we could have, we could have just lied, you know, <laughs> it would have been a lot easier, but, um, <laughs> but there you go. We really did it. Um, but yeah, we, we were having problems designing it, um, you know, making use of it, um, you know, you, you, the only thing seemed to be to if you've got another character with very different skills to yours, then you know you can you can make something of that. So you know, in, in Steel Sky, there's there's a, a few a few robot things where the robot goes into the next room and does something you can't do. You know, yeah. um, that 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 was that was the extent of virtual theater in in that engine. Although I mean, it could do it. It was a full virtual theater engine, but you know, it was it was starting to become a design issue um but yeah. but um the game itself uh steel sky i mean we were we, we were stuck we were stuck on the design early on um you know we had this charles has had this had this feeling he wanted to this, this these cities in in australia in the future was was his angle but we, we were having trouble kind of um getting it to focus you know so he sent he sent myself and dave cummins across to wales one weekend to basically come up with a design away from away from distractions um so dave dave and i drove up there um messed around for two or three days and then and then realized we were meant to be back in the office and we still hadn't designed a game so uh, we basically just sat down and started i started writing notes on 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 uh, in a notebook um and it, it somehow this this design kind of flowed from nowhere <laughs> and i ended up with about 16 pages of design which i'd pass rip out and pass to dave 
Dave Cummins, who had a Apple Mac, um, the Mac Classic, um, tiny little computer thing, and uh, he he would then he would then um, type it up into into a document and um, make it a bit better as he went along. Uh, and we did that one afternoon, just just like it was a stream of consciousness thing. It just it wow. just flew, it just flowed out. And, and and at the end of end of that day, we had we had what what was a pretty serviceable design with all the characters and. And quite a lot of the things in in Beneath Still Sky are actually in that document. So, uh, you know, we, we we really did we really did just do it on that on that afternoon. You know, wow. then the next morning we headed back to back to back to Hull and said, oh, "Here you go, Charles. Here's, here's your design." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's squeaky bum time. That is. That's like okay. Yeah, we've got, we've got to get something out. And then uh, yeah, 30, it's, 30 years it's later, not, we're still not, sorry. About it. It's not. It's not. It's not a bad way to do something creative, you know. Just, just get down to the very last possible. I mean, you hear this story from 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 other people who've been tasked with some creative. I mean, no one, no one just starts it and does it. You, you, you it's got to go down to the wire. <laughs> uh, so you just got no choice but to start typing, you know. Yeah, that's um. That reminds me of my university dissertation and having an entire year to write it, and I did it in the weekend <laughs> before it was due. <laughs> there you go. Then it works. Yeah. Cramming, it works. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we've gone Lord of Temptures, Beneath the Steel Sky, two of my favourite games, I must say. Um, and uh, and then obviously we come into Broken Sword, which uh, is, you know, it spawned sequels. It's talked about still today as one of the bona fide classics of the so-called golden era um, of the 90s. Um, what was your involvement with that? I mean, how how did that come about? Because it was, um, it seemed like, it, even, even on the... Um, it seemed like quite a departure from obviously it wasn't it wasn't um pixel art per se um it was it was world um globe trotting um it was historical i mean it was different to anything that was kind of on the scene all, all the all the other games around the time were fairly humorous and you know in it for the laughs um this one was very quite dramatic so tell us where the uh, your story about broken sword uh but the the company itself had grown a lot, um, and we were we we'd moved across. I mean, Lure Lure and Steel Sky. The, the important thing to understand with those games is they were done with virtually no no budget. It, it, it was virtually nothing. You know, it, it was it. The, the, there's more more money spent on the on the intro sequences of modern games than than Beneath the Steel Sky cost. You know. Uh, it, it was it was literally peanuts, um, and we were we were quite you know we were up in Hull, Hull at the time, which was which was pretty pretty grim in the eighty in the in the eighties and nineties, um, and it's great now, but it was it was it was grim as hell then, um, and and very industrial as as a back lo- backdrop, and and in a way, um, beneath the steel sky kind of reflects that that you know our mood at the time and where we where we were and you know all, all the rest of it. Um, by by the end of that project, I mean there had been lots of political shifts with within um, going from Mirrorsoft to to Virgin Interactive, um, but uh, af- after Steel Sky, the 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 thing that happened was that Virgin came to us and said, uh, you know, they were looking at Monkey Island and stuff like that, uh, and they said we should we should have a have a crack at, at doing a big adventure game you know and and try and take it to the to the americans and and maybe even crack the american market at the same time and the way to do that was not not to do it on a total shoestring like um steel sky had been the, the, you know the, they said let's throw money at it you know uh you know how much how much do you need um and they actually bought into revolution they bought they bought a, a, some shares in the company and and and, and committed to funding a game um quite quite generously for the for the era you know uh so uh, uh, and the attitude was you know whatever you need to do do it even better you know so you know we, we went and got don blue Faltis from ireland to do the to do the line drawing backgrounds and and uh, and, and design the characters and stuff like that i mean it was all it was all very good stuff you know it wasn't it wasn't back bedroom development anymore it was it was um it was, um, you know, go and get go and get a, a really great composer from from TV and film, you know, which is where Barry came in and and, and things like that, you know, and a really good a, a team of coloring coloring artists for the backgrounds and, um, you know, it was it was basically no expense spared in in a way, 
um well i say that i mean it was still it was still quite tight but it was it was magnitudes more than than steel sky you know yeah did you prefer that way of working or you preferred like your small teams like you did in the earlier games uh I suppose ultimately I preferred it small. You know, I think I think Steel Sky was a great a great size game and a, and a good sized team. I mean, it was all a little bit too tight, but uh, and we only just got away with Steel Sky. You know, a, a bit if we'd had double the budget and the same size game, it would have been about right to be honest. But mm. um, uh, Broken Sword, yeah, it it, 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 I mean, it was like forty people by the end. Um, and the office was crammed crammed full, you know, and uh, the game the game had grown pretty pretty big really and it had it had so much dialogue you know uh, that that cost a fortune to um to 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 um, record um yeah. uh, we got into a lot of trouble for that actually they they weren't they weren't happy um when, when they got the bill for the recording you know the voice recording um and uh, uh, i the design i wasn't i wasn't actually much to do with it i mean i, I was kind of there at the beginning but then it, the whole thing was so big that i just kind of um you know, I, I retreated off into the into the engine side of it because uh, in the earlier games, everybody was doing a bit of everything. Um, you know, Steel Steel Sky it, 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 in 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 a reasonable part is my design. Um, Broken Sword certainly less so. It was more more from from Charles. That yeah. One. yeah. Now, from... and to go back, actually, the point. Yeah. Sorry, the point I was trying to make uh, when I originally started. Uh, uh, Steel Sky is, a, is it, it kind of reflected Hull. By this point, we've moved to York, and, and Broken Sword is is a very York game, you know. Yeah, His, historics and, and 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 stone walls and and swords yeah. and stuff. You know, it's it's a it's got a Yorky feel to it. Yeah, definitely more influential um, for where you are in York. Um, now, from an outsider's point of view, um, Broken Sword did amazingly well. And obviously, it spawned several sequels. Um, did you dive pretty much straight into the sequel as soon as the first one was out? Because it came out within like a year or two, didn't it? It was pretty pretty quick. Uh, yeah, I mean, we we were we were always signed to do four four games, uh, and we didn't know what the second one was. But I mean, the the problem with the problem with um, having a company that size doing one big game is that you. You know, when you finish when you finish one, what what happens the week after? You know, because you've got all these people, you've got thirty people um, sat at desks. What what are they going to do on the Monday morning when they come back, having finished Broken Sword one on the on the Friday afternoon? You know, it's it's a difficult problem. Yeah. So y you have to start planning like uh, six months before. Um, so we we were we were talking to to Virgin Interactive about what the next game would be. Um, uh, and and the problem was that um, the the management had changed quite a lot within Virgin. So when it, when when Broken Sword started, they were like, you know, their their whole thing was as as I said, throw the money at it, do the best one ever, it'll be great, uh, and it and it and it was great. You know, it worked. The, the game was pretty good. Um, the new management came in, and they were sort of saying. Uh, what what is this game? What it's about? Uh, te Templars and swords and stuff. Where adventures and we, what what is all this? You know, we, we we're not sure we like this. And we've we're looking at the looking at the numbers and we've spent a fortune on it. You know, what, we don't even know that it's going to sell. You know, we we need to um, correct this terrible mistake made by our predecessors and and squeeze some money out of this investment. So so that's where Broken Sword Two came in, and and they basically said, right, you've got instead of two years, you've got you've got one year and you've got half the budget squeeze it squeeze the follow-up out and we'll we'll hopefully recoup the money you know they were they were quite quite snarky about it and they, and they didn't they didn't necessarily or, or this particular person didn't necessarily believe it was it was ever going to recoup its money you know um and, and and as i said before they were absolutely obsessed with resident evil and things like that and they were going we want we want blood and guts and, and zombies and <laughs> stuff like that you know they, they were they were they were the, the tone had changed quite a lot and the irony of course is that that you know here we are for the I mean, 25 26 years later and broken sword is still still a thing and still selling you know so uh, they, they were they were very uh wrong in their, in their in their pessimism about what what they'd invested in yeah yeah so those are the first, um, you know, bunch of games from Revolution Software. This is the mid '90s now, and um, the adventure game world is obviously moving uh, into a more 
three-dimensional world, which you take head on in Broken Sword 3. Were you involved much? Uh, Broken Sword 3. Um... I'm trying to remember the the order now. We we'd actually done in Cold Blood before Brink Sword Three, hadn't we? I think. Uh, for the PlayStation One, yes, you had it. Was. Uh well, I mean, obviously after Brink Sword Two, um, the the old story of American Parent brings down successful UK publisher, and that's what happened with Version Interactive. Uh, I mean, it was starting to to happen uh, towards the end of Brink Sword One, hence all the the, the management changes, but. Um, that that thing completely imploded, um, like ninety whatever it was eight or something like that. Mm. Um, now, co- coincidentally, we we'd had great success on the PlayStation with the the ports of Broken Sword one and two. I mean, it, uh, you know, it wasn't it wasn't supposedly going to do. Uh, it was it was meant to be barely worth porting to the PlayStation, and it actually did extremely well, selling selling hundreds and hundreds of thousands of of, of games on on the PlayStation. Mm-hmm. So, and because of that, we built up a relationship with Sony Interactive uh, Europe, uh, who who were great. Um, so after after Virgin uh, Interactive went down, we we basically jumped ship to to Sony, and uh, you know they 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 were like, uh, well, we, you know, we, we like what you do with stories and characters, but you know we need to PlayStation it up a bit. Um, <laughs> hence hence in Cold Blood with its this um, kind of combat and mixed into an adventure. You know, um, it's kind of here's the things we want to do and here's the things we don't want to do all in all in one game, <laughs> and that's that's in Cold Blood. Um, uh, after that, uh, they were kind of, you know, they, they were kind of, well, we'll see how it does. Um, see, see, you, see you in a year or so, you know, we'll, we'll let you know. Um, so we were kind of casting around and th- uh, by this point, Broken Sword had proved itself and, and was, and, w- and, and was shown to have done quite well. So, uh, it, uh and was still selling. So, it, you know, it was a valuable, valuable franchise and that's, that's what we, kind of went back to in order to survive basically um after in cold blood so we we ended up with thq uh, and they were like yeah you know we the world has changed uh we like broken sword but it's got you know we'll do one but it needs to be kind of a lot cheaper and 3d uh, and that's basically standard publisher yeah um response at that at that time so you know it's kind of Either either you close the whole thing down and do something different, or or do what you can to survive. You know, and we we always had this feeling that that we could reinvent the adventure into something that would work on on modern platforms. And um, you know, it didn't seem too bad to to do a three D. You know, the, the problem with Broken Sword is all that hand drawn stuff. I mean, it, it was it was very it was the very low resolution. That's that's the important thing to to remember. So. I mean, there was masses of it. There was there was just masses of animation and, and whatever, but it was also small. Now, if you you know if you, if you look at the machines ten years later and resolutions had grown and you know it just seemed unfeasible to to be able to do another Broken Sword in two D in the same quality as Broken Sword one. Yeah, um, it just it just seemed impossible. So so you know we had to look. You know we had to respect what what we were being told, which was do it in three D because you know. You do it. You make a three D George, and then all you got to do is animate him, and and massive, massive cost savings is is how it's sold. You know, um, I mean, the problem with three D games is that that there's a lot of other stuff that comes along and bites you because it's just generally a lot more complicated. So you know, yeah. you might you might save a bit of time with your three D George, but you lose a lot of time making the whole thing work. But you know, th- there's a reason why games are late, and it's because games are complicated, and the more the more ambitious they are and the more the more 3d they are and, and the more they've got to do the, the later they'll be you know yeah. um so and, and again it, you know it, it was a much it was a much smaller budget than broken sword one so um and and, and, a, and a tight schedule as well so yeah. we ended up having to repeat things you know climbing up walls you know that's that's a good thing because you can repeat it and pushing crates around as you as you as you will see <laughs> is something that you can repeat quite quite cheaply in order to come in on time you know so yeah. th- th- those were the compromises but you know we we were we were kind of okay with it because we thought it was maybe leading somewhere you know so it was it was it was it was worth a go you know yeah um i think it's great i think it's really really great and um 
the the I, I think the not the backlash as such that's the wrong word but the you know coming from a personal point of view as well the first two were amazing story wise graphics wise and i looking back now um i was a snob <laughs> i was like if it's not classically point and click i'm not going to play it and i feel like the genre as a whole kind of um there's the, the, the so-called wilderness years which is from 2000 to let's say 2010 2012 ish something like that um and obviously yeah. after broken sword three i mean it seems to do all right i mean i have several copies of it on different systems all over the place um you you worked on on broken sword four which was again um 3d i mean talk us through um your experience with broken sword four uh well it, it, it was a very bad experience um i mean it, it was it was much later on um and you know we'd there's a lot of details of things that happened after broken sword three Broken Sword 4 was again THQ coming back and you know reducing the budget again. And you know, we'd we'd kind of lost most of the company by that point. We didn't have much left. It was just like the core, the core original team. Uh, and it was, it was it, there was almost nothing there. Uh and they said, hey, let's let's dig out Broken Sword and and you know, do do another, do another sequel. Uh, but they and then they said, but you're not going to develop it. It's going, we're going to give it to um, a, a porting house um, in Yorkshire called in Sheffield called um, Sumo Digital, and they'll they'll do the dev and you'll do the design and um, that that will be that. So I mean, for myself, it's kind of grim because I was the I was effectively the or one of the lead programmers on on the development of all the previous games. So clearly, I wasn't going to be doing that um, on this game that was going to be done by Sumo. So you know, I I did some design early on, and then that was that was pretty much it for me. Yeah, um, I think I have a copy unopened. I've never played it. You've I'm never a bit played like you. it. I'm a bit I, like I you haven't. No, so three. Yeah, yeah. Well, my my thing at the minute is I'm playing through um, all the Broken Sword on my YouTube channel from from the first. I even played the fan game um, in order. So I'm halfway through the third at the minute, and I will be playing the fourth. Um, but I've always I've heard that story before as well. From I think Charles mentioned it as well that. Um, although it's got revolution on the title and it's it's um it's uh, got broken sword on the title as well, I mean, do you still class it as your as as your game as such? Well, in 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 a way, I mean, it's Charles's design, um, yeah. so it, in that sense, it it is a revolution game. Yeah. Um, I mean, the the, the thing for revolution was we 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 were always very interested in the in the actual artistry of of stitching these games together. I mean, you know. You, you don't get broken sword one without really um caring about what you're doing and doing things in a certain a certain with a certain attitude you know which is that you're crafting something and and you, you know you if, if something isn't good enough it has to be fixed and and you you know we, we put a lot more hours in, into those games than that than was being funded you know yeah. um but we made them as good as possible you know we didn't we didn't compromise and we 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 got the game we wanted and it's always worth doing that i mean it's difficult at the time but the fact that we're talking about broken sword one all these years later um just justifies the 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 craft of, of put it putting the thing together you know yeah now if you if you just you know if 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 broken sword four is just a, a cynical publisher ploy to to hit some quarterly profit targets a, a year down the line, then then you're in a different kind of scenario, you know, which, which is effectively all it was. It was just, you know, it was it was it was it, it makes some money, you know, d dish out this game which we've got the sequel rights to and and do another one, you know. Yeah. Now, you know, uh, I mean, Charles put a lot of work into the design and made it as good as he could, but it, it wasn't the same crafted experience that 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 we like to do at Revolution. Yeah. So after that sour experience then and, and the company kind of stripped to its bare bones, um, was it round about here where you uh ported uh Beneath the Steel Sky and started work on the Broker Sword remasters? Was that around about the same time afterwards? Uh well I think what I think the order is and I should know because I've just written about it all, but um <laughs> I should read. I should read my own book and and, and remember it again. I, I mean, a lot of things happened. Um, a, a, a lot of detailed things happened. But I I think that the the first good thing that happened from the real wilderness was that Ubisoft came along and 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 said, "How about a remastered um, for the uh, DS?" 
yeah um actually we'd done we'd also done the gba sword as well of course that came before so we didn't we didn't game boy advance um broken sword which was a hell of a job because you know you're taking a two cd game down to an eight megabyte cartridge uh that that was quite an interesting experience um that was probably one of the best things i've ever done actually i, I was thinking about it recently and you know, you know the fact that we did it and it's as good as it is yeah you know, I, I really i really love gba sword it's a, it's, a, it's a great thing and it's relatively unknown i think um you should give that a go. It's 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 really interesting. I should try all the iterations of Broken Sword. Yeah, I didn't. Um, yeah, yeah. That's a lot of data to go two CDs worth, CD ROMs worth full, and then it gets onto a teeny tiny yeah. cartridge, eight meg. That's impressive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we completely rewrote it. Um, I mean, it's not as big. It, it, it's got it's got a lot of stuff taken out in order to to fit that cartridge. You know, so it's it, it is a it's Broken Sword light, but it's it's got the you know it's got yeah. the core path through it yeah. um so we did that uh and we all and we also did broken sword 2 gba and then the publisher went bust like a week before it was finished oh, so man. that that never actually came out it exists but it never came out um, oh, wow. it was it was in beta so it had a few it had a few things to fix but it was yeah. it was probably a month a month away from being publishable wow. so that was a shame then we were in the in the in the middle of nowhere again for a while and then ubisoft came along and said um ds um broken sword nintendo ds broken sword um we'll call it we'll add a bit to it can you add a bit to it and and uh, just to just to differentiate it you know hmm. and that was what became the that, that's what became the director's cut eventually i guess yeah because the extra the extra bits went into the ds version and at this point, we, because it because it was it was leading on the DS, it was it was logical to base it on the GBA game, which was which was also Nintendo and and cartridge sized, you know. So we st we basically took the GBA game, added to that, rather than attempted another squeeze the squeeze the original game onto the Nintendo DS, because it that wouldn't have worked. It, it would have been too big you know it, yeah. so we'd, we'd have ended up rewriting it anyway yeah so that wow. was that was where the that's the origin of the director's cut um uh, and as you'll know a lot of people uh, are very unhappy saying we 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 butchered the original game <laughs> or, but that the, that's not actually how it happened you know it, it came from a different it came a different direction um, yeah in truth wow. um so this uh, that was like the mid noughties I presume. Now you say you 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 left Revolution uh, two thousand fourteen, and before you left, there was the Kickstarter for Broken Sword five. Um, this is kind of before Kickstarter was a thing. I guess it was kind of around about the same time. Um, it was kind of coming out. I mean, how did you how did you decide to plow ahead with a fifth Broken Sword? Um. And go down the Kickstarter route. How do you how do you approach that? Well, it, it all of that came came after considerable success on iPhone. So yeah. after 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 the after the director's cut, uh, the iPhone made an appearance in like where it was two thousand and eight something like that. Um, and again, we didn't we didn't foresee that, and we started reading articles about how how iPhone games were selling in America and. Um, we started to be kind of conscious of it, but you know, phones were still terrible kind of Nokia type things over here. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think eventually uh, Apple themselves, the, the, their UK guys rang us up and said, um, can we come and see you? And Charles and I were like, you know, we've actually had nothing again. We were down to nothing. Um while we waited to see what the Nintendo games did. And the, and the two Apple guys came up to see us, um, which is not something that would happen today, uh, and said, and they basically pitched us the iPhone and said, um, can you do Broken Sword? Uh, and we said, uh, we, 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 we could. Um, none of us had an iPhone, which was a bit embarrassing. So we had to hide, <laughs> we had to hide our, our crappy phones somewhere else, you know, <laughs> and pretend we had them on uh, iPhones on order, you know, um, <laughs> Which we soon did, uh, but we said we said uh, we're a bit worried about the size. So because uh, the, the apps were t were like really small, they were like thirty meg at that point in time. Uh, so we said we'll do Steel Sky first. So we did Steel Sky, 
um, to, to huge, huge um, um, enthusiasm from from the from the fan base and the and the, the players on mobile. I mean, uh, I remember it on Twitter, people were just retweeting, going, uh, you know, holy shit, an adventure on a phone, it's it's unbelievable. Um, yeah. It just went crazy, uh, and that game did really well. Um, sold sold really well, so we naturally went straight on, straight on to Broken Sword, which was a, a another another big challenge to get to get onto the um, onto the iPhone, and that and that that code base was the was the um, the, the DS game, you know, so GBA DS iPhone um, director's cut code base, um, and again it did it did extremely well on iPhone, and then and then a bit later the iPad. Um, so at this point, we were actually we were actually building the company again because because we were making real real royalties and stuff from from the app store. You know, it was actual actual money. You know, it was it was astonishing. Yeah. So we start we started to get to the point where we could we could think, well, maybe we could we could one day make another game. You know, an, an original game. Uh, uh, and it seemed I mean it seemed logical to do to do a broken sword because it's just what we were known for. You know, so you know there's only there's only so many risks you can take, and making a whole new game an original is a risk. So let's let's de-risk it slightly and, and make a broken sword five. You know, mm. um, and we, we weren't sure how we were going to do it. I mean, you know, we started off um, we were just going to write write a demo and like one one section of it and see see where it went. You know, see go and see publishers or, or you know find some way to do it. Um, and and then the thing that the thing that really changed things was the the double fine kickstarter um yeah because you know that we, we sat and watched that and we couldn't believe it, it, it you know the, they raised they raised more than enough money to do broken, broken sword a broken sword game and do it reasonably properly you know so that that kind of changed everything from for us because we, before that we, we were kind of going crowdfunding and maybe maybe not and looking at different ways of doing it and maybe doing it ourselves and uh, you know we weren't sure maybe go to a publisher weighing up different options and, and literally like a, a month after the, the the double fine one finished we, we'd absolutely committed ourselves to kickstarter you know yeah yeah and, and we went down that route i mean we, we did we did pretty well i mean uh you know we had the highest ever european uh kickstarter number for, for that back in whenever it was 2012 was it um, yeah I mean, it wasn't. It was the funny thing was it wasn't anything light enough to make the game that we eventually made. But um, you know, it got it got us quite a long way. Yeah. So I mean, that is a you know from the start of the eighties through to Broken Sword Five. Um, that is your time in games, and obviously you are still going ahead and making games now. But um, the reason you're on this podcast is you know you've that's you've talked about all that, but you've written all of that down in a book. Um, I have. Yeah, so um, that book. Um, t- tell us about the book. And you, there was a successful Kickstarter again, Kickstarter, in uh, the back end of last year. Um, it got funded and then some. Um, so, um, what's the process now? Is it finished? Is it? Is it the printers? You still got work to do. Where are you at the minute? Uh, I'll show you. I'll show you something. Here it is copy number one. Oh wow. Um, fresh from the printers well i've had it a couple of weeks um the, the way printing works is you you um uh you know you, you commit to to printing a certain number uh which in this case will be a thousand because um it turns out that print i mean i i the kickstarter was like 600 copies something like that um which is pretty pretty amazing pretty pretty mind-blowing to be honest um because yeah. again I, I had no idea how well it would do or or, or whatever you know because you know you're effectively selling a book that no one's read which is <laughs> which is kind of a flaw in in the in the plan but uh there was such enthusiasm that, that, that i was i was so totally touched by it. you know it was, it was amazing yeah um, and, t- and it had been 10 years since the 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 last Kickstarter, which is about what you need to be honest to recover from the, uh, <laughs> from, the from the process uh, from the from the month of stress, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, yeah, so so uh, yeah, the, the way it works in printing is it's it's basically better to do a thousand print a thousand of them than it is to to some in between number like six hundred, you know. Yeah. So there's a fact there's another nine hundred and ninety nine heading my way in 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 probably two three weeks time I'll, I'll get all of those then i'll start um sending them out and all that stuff that you've got to do yeah yeah 
So um, with the writing of the book, um, was it difficult to like pick apart your timeline? I mean, we've just gone through it here in an hour. Obviously, you've you've got a lifetime of stuff to go through. Um, was it hard to get it in timeline order and figure out what was important and what what wasn't? <laughs> How do you go ahead it, doing that? It it was fairly hard because um, I mean, some things I remember really well. Like if you go back to the eighties and school school days and 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 the, in the run up to everything everything running up to broken sword one i actually remember it extremely well um because it was it was big things happening that were quite intense you know um and i, and I thought that the rest of it would be like that once we got once it went into broken sword development and, and then onwards it became much much more difficult because it was it was more not mundane isn't the word but it was just it was just regular stuff you know yeah. Uh, until until there was i mean there were some big dramatic events um, that happened to the company but you know often years between them so uh piecing the actual timeline together and, and all of the other little projects and stuff that we tried to get off the ground that no one's ever heard of and things like that but which were very interesting um things mm-hmm. to to document um for those i mean i i uh, luckily, I, I always kept a, a diary of of tasks done. Uh, it's like the opposite of a to do list. I, I write a done list, um, and I have those going back to about two thousand and eight. Um, I have emails as well from from kind of that era all the way up uh, when I switched to Gmail back in the whenever it was many years ago. I was like one of the first Gmail users. So I mean, the beauty of Gmail is it's all there. It's you know nothing ever gets deleted, so you you can go back and search it. Yeah. So I, I first of all put together a, a pretty good timeline. You know this happened, this happened, this happened, uh, and then I went to talk to I, I did like three hours of interviews with Charles to pick his brain, and, and which he found very interesting because he'd forgotten a lot of stuff, and, and people forget things, but you can remind them if you say well, if you say if I say Charles, do you remember do you remember what we did in in 1996, and he's going. No, because <laughs> it's too it's too vague a question. But yeah. If if you say, well, um, uh, you know, we actually went to this meeting. Do you remember this meeting when we talked about this? And you'll go, oh yeah, I remember that. And so and so was there. So you, if you if you know how to if you know how to how to put the questions to people, you can tease out all sorts of information. So I mean, I, I basically I I wrote the timeline and then I wrote a bunch of questions at all all points where I knew I'd have to go to other people. So I went to talk to Dave Sykes, who was one of the one of the four co-finders, and uh, asked him a load of questions. Steve Ince, we did like probably four hours on on Zoom talking about stuff that 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 Steve might know. And Steve's got a great memory, so he, he he's very an- analytical and uh, was very useful as well. Talked to Charles, talked to Noreen, uh, looked looked at emails one after another, you know, um, yeah. reading reading what we were talking about. <laughs> And and drew up a pretty comprehensive timeline. Yeah, was there ever a point from... where you, where you were um where you were talking to someone and then they mentioned something and you were like, no, that didn't happen. And they were like, no, you did, you did. Was there ever like crossed wires at all and go like, no, that didn't happen. That happened in eighty eight. No, it didn't happen in ninety seven. Uh, yeah, th- there was some things where we were we were debating the order, like did did this happen before that, and and it, I, I had some big blocks of things which needed needed shifting around um to get the order right um there's i mean i i was i was pretty much aware of the business side all, all the way through it but not but not always involved in in all of the things so you know i had to had to had to talk to charles and Lauren about about a lot of business type things um and you get and then you get into the sort of realm of politics where i i might i might be thinking well this person you know did us a favor or this person really kicked us when we were down and it, it's actually more complicated than that or i've got you know i might have some kind of bias in, in my thinking and, and it's quite important to get other people's point of view on certain things to actually get the truth i mean a, a, a lot of i mean a lot of the book is it's, it's always going to be subjective as to who's the good guys and who's the bad guys all the way through um and and for me the bad guys are corporates with spreadsheets <laughs> in, in 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 life in general and also in the, in the story of revolution you know so yeah. they're the bad guys um i don't like them there's a lot of people i don't like with with um that that kind of business type 
background interfering in things and, and generally not doing not doing the righteous thing and, and not not caring about games but caring about profits and you know all that stuff I mean, it, that is the games industry you know it's 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 it has an ugly underside of of corporate profiteering and um there's a lot there's a lot of people who are not who are, who are basically cowboys still operating yeah. at, at high level in the background um and i talk about a lot of that now charles charles is a bit more diplomatic than me i mean he he, he has better relationships with these people than i i did i mean i was someone who was seeing what was happening and not not necessarily able to influence it um you know charles charles has has some friendships that go wider than i do so you know i might be saying one thing charles would have a slightly different view so it was important to 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 find the right line that everyone's happy with yeah well you sold 600 and something copies left so there's 300 and something copies um remaining um where can people grab a copy of that now uh right now they can just they could they basically if if anyone dms me in some in some way then then i can i can um sell them a copy um at some point fairly soon it will go on to indiegogo because they do they have a new product which is effectively a shop you know it's like they they call it like uh they've got a special word for it, I can't remember what it is it's basically post campaign where you still where you it's not the campaign anymore but it the, the mechanism of selling yeah still the perks and whatever that that continues indefinitely so uh they wrote to me and said hey do you want to do this um and it seemed like a good idea to give indiegogo a try so um because i might do another kickstarter at some point um, yeah so maybe i'll go indiegogo maybe i'll go kickstarter um, yeah it'd be good to have experience of both so i'm gonna i'm gonna set that up and it probably two three weeks that, that will go live so people will be able to 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 buy it through through indiegogo if they don't awesome. want to go direct to me but yeah there's another there's basically the best part 400 copies yeah to, to find out awesome. well I, I, once that link is live i'll make sure that i'll put a, a uh, put it in the description of this um of this podcast so people can go and cool. go and grab yourself a copy um now before i leave you because i'm very conscious that i've kept you for bloody ages um and I still no, have fine. reams of questions, but I'll just I'll I'll narrow it down a few. Um, now you are still in the games uh, industry as such. Uh, like, what, what are you up to? Like, what game are you working on at the minute? I'm writing a game called Wormhole Dungeon, which is a I guess you would call it a Metroidvania. Um, it's more it's more what I would call an arcade adventure or an action adventure in that it's it it takes it takes the stuff. From the genre that Obsidian was in back in the eighties, you know, arcade adventure they called it in the eighties. Um, it's basically Metroidvania now, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, all my experience, and I like that genre um, as well as adventure games. But all, all everything I learned through through Revolution, writing characters and narrative and puzzles and stuff, that all of that stuff's gonna go in. So it'll be, it'll be a slightly different, a slightly different variation on the on the Metroidvania theme. You know, you'd be able to shoot things, but it won't be particularly. It's not going to be a, a particularly skill-based um, game, and there'll be there'll be lots of characters and puzzles and stuff. So, it, and a very unusual hybrid game. Yeah, but you know, well, I don't care. I'm just going to do what I want to do. <laughs> I think you've earned that right. Absolutely. Um, uh, I'm just going to end with one question now. Um, you, uh, I recently saw on Instagram that you were signing um, copies of In Cold Blood. Um, to help support the um, the war in Ukraine. Now you are quite a uh, a vocal a vocal um, member about the war in Ukraine. Can you just tell us a little bit about your involvement in that and why why you've gone down the route of um, selling those copies and, and raising money? Uh, well, my wife is Ukrainian, so um, I'm, I'm closer to it than you ordinarily would be. Um, I've kind of spent probably a good year more than a year living in ukraine of the last of the last five or six years so uh, i know it quite well and it's 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 a great country and great people and um you know they're 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 smart and funny and it's just a great place and to see see this stuff going on it's just uh it's unbelievable you know places that you know and people that you know uh it's just it's just it's just crazy it has to be stopped and uh if it isn't stopped they'll they'll keep going they'll go into they'll go into um, Poland and, and they'll, they'll keep going, you know, so they, they, they have to be stopped one way or another. And um, what, what can I do about it? Well, you know, just they, they need, they need things like drones and Starlinks, uh, uh, satellite, Starlink satellite receivers are, are super useful on the front line. So 
um i i I suddenly realized I had boxes and boxes full of ink or bloods um, that had been sitting around. And I, I quite like hoarding stuff and, and I, I buy my buy my old games on eBay all the time. But um, <laughs> I'd, I, it starts to be a problem to be honest, but I thought that maybe I can do something useful with these, um, with these ink or bloods because they, they were new copies, you know, of, yeah. of ICB that just, they, they just moved house with me several times and I've, I've just dragged them around so i thought well maybe maybe someone would some someone would like these if me and charles signed them you know um you know i thought i might be i thought in a couple of weeks with a couple of weeks i might be able to sell 20 of them um and and i sold 13 three days and then then i, and then I ran out of copies um to sell so I mean that was just that was just amazing, and um, you know we bought two Starlinks in the end, and uh, they're actually in they're in they're in Ukraine now. Wow, that's amazing. Um, well done. <laughs> Thank so, you. So uh, if um if anyone can support uh, that cause at all, do you have like any links or anything to to send them to, or should I just send them uh, your way? Uh, I I don't. Um, there's um actually there's a if you, if you if you google saint javelin um you'll you'll find a website that 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 sells sells stuff and um accepts donations and they're, they're quite a quite a credible place to to donate to um saint javelin um it's kind of a it's kind of an icon of the anti-tank gun thing yeah. that they use um um so that's that's a good that's a good thing to do. Uh, I might try and do something else. Um, I'm going to talk to Charles and maybe we can. I'm thinking maybe doing some some special posters, burnt sword posters that that will get signed by everybody. And maybe that's a, maybe that's another thing we can do. And if people are interested, and uh, raise some more money, um, maybe send some drones, buy yeah. buy a couple of drones, send those as well. That sounds so great. I'm thinking thinking of something something new to do. Yeah. Well, um, I will Google that and I'll find the the link. And again, I'll stick that in the description down below. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's been like nearly an hour and a half, Tony. So, <laughs> thank you so so much for uh, for having this huge long chat. Um, where uh, one thing that I did forget to say is, what's the name of the book so that people can obviously Google it if they're not hanging around. Uh, the name of the book is Revolution: The Quest for Game Development Greatness there you go folks um i'll leave all the links down below so you can go and buy yourself a copy i will um i will get myself one definitely um and it's been a delight so yeah good luck with the book and good luck with uh with the with the metroidvania and uh thank yeah you. it's been a wonderful to talk to you um so yeah thanks very Cheers. much Tony. thank you very much so that was my interview with tony warriner of revolution software one of the nicest people we've ever had on the podcast yeah, such a lovely lovely chap um, now in the next couple of weeks in the next episode we are going to be speaking to the guys from the foretold which is an adventure game slash rpg slash card game uh, which is very interesting and very different i managed to play it at uh, adventure x last year I and mean, they gave out physical cards as well like a deck of cards very interesting and those guys will be launching a kickstarter as well so we'll be talking all about that that will be coming up in the in a fortnight's time where i will be joined with a very much well turian shepherd and until next time you have a wonderful morning afternoon or evening whatever it is you're doing right now and take care <laughs>